Uh, we're joined today by Olivia Kirkendall, who is our expert here on carbon taxes. Uh, and she's going to help uh, walk us through uh, how carbon taxes work and how they've been applied in, in some other places and how maybe the U.S. could do it or maybe even some you know, state or regions could do it. Um, so if you have questions on that, just like I said, chime in as we go along here today. So Olivia, why don't we, why don't you, we start with some introductions? If you just want to give us a little bit about your backstory, we'd appreciate that. Sure, thanks. Um... I'm super glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I am calling in from Maryland, first and foremost, um, a Delaware neighbor. Um, and I uh, studied environmental resources and economics at University of Maryland College Park. Um, and I've also um, interned for Chesapeake Climate Action Network in the past, uh, which uh, on a campaign for uh, carbon pricing in the District of Columbia in DC. And then also I am a volunteer for the Citizens Climate Lobby um, organization, which is a bipartisan climate action um, organization that is focusing on a carbon fee and dividend bill. Um, and thank you again for having me. <laughs> thank you for joining. Uh, and we've had a couple of new people join us and uh, some people jumping on Facebook. So just one more time, uh, if you have questions, drop it in the chat uh, or the comments on Facebook and we'll pull those right in. Uh, you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, just drop them when you got them. Um, so why don't we start out? I feel like it's always good to kind of define what we're talking about here in, in some of these more policy wonky discussions. Um, so why don't you just kind of give us like a quick rundown. What is a carbon tax just as a basic? Sure. So um, carbon pricing is like a, a market-based mechanism to make polluters, people, uh, industries, companies that emit carbon pay for the, the emittance that they, they release. Um, and the, the whole point of, of the pricing mechanism is to deter these companies and these industries from continuing to pollute carbon at the level that they are doing it um, and instead incentivizing them to, to innovate, to uh, have less carbon intensive technology and production lines um, by making it more and more expensive for them to, to pollute. And so there's two main types of, of carbon pricing. There's the cap and trade and then there's a carbon tax or tax or fee, um, depending on on how how you would like to say that. Some people have a, a preference to call it a fee or a tax. Um, and carbon, uh, excuse me, uh, cap and trade is is when the government sets uh, a cap or a maximum amount of emissions for either a region, a state, a nation. Um, how much emissions uh, industries and companies within their region are allowed to emit. Um, and they do that by giving them permits to emit. Um, and if a company uh, wants to emit more than their permits, they either have to pay a penalty for doing so, or they have to purchase um, permits from companies or industries that are, um, that are selling some of their permits because um, they either um, don't emit carbon or they emit less carbon than they are permitted. Um, so in that case, the, the price that is set on carbon is based on what the, the market allows it to be versus a carbon tax or fee, uh, which is where the government sets the price of carbon. And then the amount of emissions reduction or emissions um, carbon emissions are based on what the market allows it to be. So, um, so once, once these industries, these companies have to pay um, the, the set price of carbon that they admit, um, they, um, they then sort of decide from there how much carbon they choose to, to admit um, or Instead, you know, as I said before, choosing to innovate to use technology that's less 
less carbon intensive um, or reduce their carbon emissions somehow. Um, sort of a smaller scale way that might be more of like consumable uh, way to think about it is how we tax tobacco. So um, tobacco we know is bad for our health. And so in turn, the government wanted people to, to use less tobacco. Um, and so uh, to do that, to deter, deter people from using tobacco, they taxed it um, to make it more expensive for people to maintain a smoking habit or what have you. Um, and instead, uh, people who, who smoke would instead possibly, or I guess the idea of it would, would um, try to smoke less so that their, their habit wouldn't be so expensive. Um, and so, uh, car so carbon pricing, that sort of mechanism is, is the same in that we're putting a price on the, the pollutants so that it will deter them from polluting and in turn um, possibly spend that money somewhere else so that they can pollute less. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, so <clears throat> I know you've kind of been following along kind of carbon tax uh, or cap and trade programs kind of <clears throat> in the US. So um, has anything been passed in the US or uh, maybe on a local or state level, obviously on a federal level, right? I think we would all probably have heard about that, but um, has anything happened on any state or, or local levels? Or maybe is there, are there other countries that have done this? So um, fortunately, there are grassroots efforts for for some sort of carbon pricing in every state or almost every state. Um, unfortunately, there's not many states that have actually passed some sort of carbon pricing mechanism. So um, one example of a state that has is California uh, passing their cap and trade, which happened uh, a while back. Um, and then there's also the District of Columbia uh, that passed a carbon tax um, strictly on energy, um, which was part of a whole uh, clean energy bill um, that also had components of other ways to reduce emissions um, like renewable, renewable portfolio standards, things like that. Um, and then there are some states that have passed it to a certain extent, but has been um, either vetoed or held back uh, through other sort of legislation. Um, so for example, the state of Washington, they passed uh, some sort of carbon pricing legislation in the, the Senate, their Senate. Um, however, it, it didn't end up passing their house. Um, and then for, for Massachusetts, they actually passed it, uh, a cap and trade sort of legislation in their house and Senate. However, their their governor vetoed it. Um, and I think I think it's definitely difficult for for states, especially small states, ha, uh, to get some sort of backing on carbon pricing because there is like a spillover effect. There is concern that if you have some sort of carbon pricing in a small state such as Maryland or or Delaware, that they um, that then these industries, these companies, will just move over to the next one that doesn't have have some sort of carbon pricing mechanism. Which, of course, I'm not saying that to deter anyone, but I think it's definitely much easier for these smaller states um, or uh, yeah, so for smaller states to sort of have um, carbon pricing mechanisms in a region versus just their state. So um, for example, Reggie um, is something that's passed on a regional basis up and down the sort of mid-Atlantic East Coast, um, having some sort of carbon pricing mechanism um, in, in a region versus just a small state is probably um, a safer safer um, bet for some some states um, and some regions. Um, and then for different countries that have some sort of carbon pricing mechanism, a lot, a lot of different countries have have something. Um, it's almost in every every continent, 
Um, <laughs> there's, you know, the the European Union has something. Um, Japan has some sort of carbon pricing mechanism. Uh, I believe Chile and Colombia do. Um, I believe South Africa does. Australia does. Um, Sounds like once again, uh, the United States is falling a little bit behind. Um, this, yeah. We talk, yeah, we talk about how far behind we are and, you know, wage and worker protections and health care. And it sounds like carbon taxes uh, right along there with it. Yep, it's it's definitely on that list. Um, the the uh, World Bank actually has a very cool uh, interactive map, which I encourage people to to look for when they have a chance that has um, a map of, of areas that have implemented some sort of carbon pricing that have tried one part of like have tried it maybe a cap and trade and now want to do a carbon tax instead um, or vice versa. So not only do some some countries have one part one type of carbon pricing, but they're actually looking for or looking to implement both you know, a cap and trade and like a carbon tax mechanism, which I found interesting. Um, oh, and Beth shared our, uh, the, yeah, that the map <laughs> uh, there. Yeah, um, so we got that. In looks the, in the looks there. right. <laughs> yeah, so for those on Facebook here, I'll, I'll copy and paste that over for y'all as well. Um, but this is why you should RSVP and join our Zoom. Uh, <laughs> where you get all this great information. Thank you for that, Beth. Um, so, yeah, I you you said uh, Reggie. For those that um, don't know what Reggie is, that stands for the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, which is a cap and trade. Which I think we're going to talk a little bit about later. Uh, what what that is, um, but it has been you know quite successful, um, not only in helping curb emissions, but also help funding initiatives that will further help curb emissions. Um, which brings us to our next question. Uh, what to do with the money that is created. So I know there's kind of different proposals, right? On the federal level, I know you're tracking all that, all that legislation there. Um, so maybe, well, why don't we back up? Why don't we go over what are some of the differences and similarities with what's being proposed in the US on the federal level? And I know as you know, we've had this conversation now for years, so there's a lot of proposals, but maybe if you could just highlight a couple. Sure. So. Um... On, on the federal level, first, I'd like to mention, you know, Chris Coons has, uh, Senator Chris Coons has a, has a carbon pricing legislation. Um, it's a carbon fee and dividend, and the, the dividend portion of, of um, the carbon pricing mechanism uh, mostly goes towards a, a rebate to low-income um, individuals. And then uh, a smaller portion of it goes towards infrastructure and um, renewable uh, and like investing in, in research for renewables. Um, and I think that kind of is similar to a lot of other um, uh, carbon pricing legislation that's, that's proposed on the federal level, at least recently in that um, the dividend either goes towards um, investing in renewables um, or investing in some sort of research and design uh, to to decarbonize our our systems, or it's going towards individuals in a revenue neutral sort of sense. Um, however, there are there are um, other proposals that that recommend. Um, the the revenue from um, carbon pricing to go go towards maybe lowering taxes things like that and that's usually the biggest difference between a lot of the carbon pricing proposals is how to use the money um, um, and something that's that's more similar about them is that they want to track how effective the the policy is, and then um, they they have a steadily growing price. Um, they usually a lot of the proposals have different starting po places for um, what price they want on on carbon, 
um, and how much they would like it to grow over time and how quickly. Um, but but something that's that's sort of across the board is that there is a steadily growing price of on carbon. Um, to try and help cajole the market, right? To invest in the technologies necessary. So that way at the end of the schedule, right? You don't have to pay these exorbitant carbon fees, I guess. Right, so and that it's, kind it's of, predictable. It makes right. it predictable too, to have, you know, a steadily growing price to say, okay, so, you know, I'm a company that, you know, emits carbon. I know that in 10 years, it's going to be wildly expensive to continue to emit carbon. So I'd rather invest in some sort of carbon eliminating solution, you know, some updating my, my technology so it emits less carbon so that I'm not paying this crazy price, you know, 10 years down the line. Um, I'd rather invest in, in these, these better solutions now than, than continuing to pay this price. And is this kind of in line with what other countries have done? They generally put the money towards the same like we're not reinventing the wheel in the United States, they generally put uh, the money towards either technology or, or cash dividend back to the whatever. Yeah, country. yes, um, I think I think one or two countries may have uh, have done it in the same in what I mentioned earlier, like the as a way to to reduce taxes. Um, but I think that's a slightly less popular um, way to use the dividend. I think it's um, some of the main um, main proposals are using it to to invest in research or to to give it back to to citizens. Yeah, I feel like well, if you use it as a way to as a mechanism to lower taxes, uh, just general taxes, right? And you kind of put yourself in a bad corner, right? I mean, if you're wanting people to have to actually pay less in the tax, right? Because they're investing in carbon reduction. Uh, technology, your tax is going to get less, hopefully, right? If it's right, if it works, your tax collection is going to get less over time. And then you're out whatever revenue you cut when you cut taxes, right? So that's, right. that's probably a little bit short sighted. But um, yeah, so uh, Charlie uh, Garlow, the wonderful, amazing Charlie Garlow, hey, Charlie, uh, as in the chat here, uh, at CCL, uh, Citizen Climate Lobby, for those following along at home, uh, right. we point out that a carbon fee and cash dividend will financially benefit lower income families. So did he asked, does your research confirm this? Um, also, also being someone who's uh, mostly been involved in, in campaigning for um, carbon fees uh, with where the revenue goes towards, um, back towards individuals, I would say yes. Um, <laughs> I would I would also say there's probably a little bit of bias in there in that, you know, most of the campaigns that I've been involved with, that I've been volunteering with, have have been policies where the, the dividend goes back towards individuals. So I guess I want to put a little bit of a disclaimer in that. But yes, I, I do believe that, that um, uh, most of the research, all the research that I've seen is that it, it does help low income individual individuals more um, because you know a carbon price will make everyday products uh, go up in price you know if you have gas like you, the cost of energy will go up and a way to sort of mitigate that is to give people back this money yeah so speaking of energy um, you know I've, I've, I've done some research on I actually wrote a paper about different options in carbon pricing you know carbon tax cap and trade as you know two main focus um, and one of the things that kept coming up was about how we how we how it addresses or, or or what impact it has on nuclear power because if you think carbon emissions right you tend to think coal uh, in, in particular right um, and not so much an emissions wise on on nuclear power. So some people were saying, is this kind of almost a, a de facto kind of um, subsidy for nuclear, right? That it, it's because it's not taxing them. Um, so mm -hmm. it, I think it's interesting. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on this on, um, you know, what does that 
scent in the market in terms of signals um, around nuclear energy. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, but since you brought it brought up uh, energy, I just uh, thought I'd throw it in there to you. Yeah, I guess I, I definitely think it would incentivize um, nuclear over, um, you know, natural gas, for example, um, and obviously coal, you know, um, um, I don't think it, it specifically in, uh, incentivize nuclear itself as because obviously we have other other sort of technologies that we're trying to invest in, you know, other sort of renewables. Um, but I do I do think that it would put nuclear kind of back up on a higher scale than it has been because I know that there's um, sort of conflict in like the environmentalist community about whether or not people support nuclear um, and I think a carbon price may uh, may put it back on a higher pedestal than it probably has been on. Yeah, certainly nuclear is the most expensive energy um, in terms of construction and, and building new plants. Um, we'll see how that paradigm shifts in the fourth and fifth generation uh, plants as they start rolling out. But certainly, you know, the Gen 1, Gen 2, 3, um, you know, the big cooling towers, right? I mean, it's monumentally expensive, which is why we pretty much all but stopped building them. But yeah, it, it will be interesting that how that conversation plays out. So um, it was, yeah, thanks for, for sharing your thoughts. So who are the voices calling for the carbon tax in the US? Do you see it as, is it really, I mean, people say it's very partisan, but has, has that been your experience as you've been working in this area? Um, I would say so. I think sort of uh, some of the bipartisanship comes from it being a policy that's sort of backed by economists and a lot of different industries and businesses. So um, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, like a, a some sort of carbon pricing mechanism is projectable. Um, you know, if it's it's a carbon fee, uh, businesses will know how to budget because they will know, um, you know, ten ten years down the line. We're emitting carbon at the at the scale that we are now. Um, we're going to have to pay this much, and so we can budget for that, or we can budget to change that. You know, um, um, so there are definitely a lot of businesses that that support some sort of carbon pricing mechanism uh, for that predictability factor, as opposed to some sort of regulation. Um, because that can be a little harder to predict, especially recently when we go from regulation that's that's put into place and then you know withdrawn and then put into place again um i think that's that's a little harder to predict for businesses and i think that's probably why they support a market-based solution not to say that businesses don't support different types of regulation as well um just from what i've seen um and then uh I, I would say that that it is bipartisan in that I think uh, more people uh, that are right leaning do prefer a market based solution as compared to um, regulation uh, because of of government involvement. Um, so I, I do see it, but I think I think getting the conversation around you know, solutions for the climate not being a partisan issue. It used to it used to not be so partisan, and now it kind of is again, and it has been for for a little while. And so I think, as as I I I think a lot of people have said this before, and <laughs> but I feel like the Republican Party is changing, and I think a lot of the younger voices in the Republican Party, uh, or who are more right leaning do want action on climate um, because it's it it heavily involves their futures and their families' futures. Um, and so they're looking for a solution that doesn't involve a lot of big government and things like that. So I think I think at least in um, you know the younger generations it's it's I would say it's pretty bipartisan. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure that's always reflected um, in in the actual policy that's that's 
um, proposed. However, uh, of some of the federal proposals before, there are Republicans who have proposed carbon pricing mechanisms. Yeah, I mean, one way to look at it for sure, right, is that it's a huge um, business opportunity, to be frank. I mean, yeah, you look at, particularly in the energy sector, particularly with coal, which is, I mean, let's be honest, it's already on its way out the door, but, um, and this could certainly potentially tip it over the other side. Um, but if you look at, you know, carbon capture technology, carbon reduction technology, right, it really is the future. And so you really, if you think about in a way that like, yeah, it may put more of a squeeze on coal, right? Um, if you look at though the rest of the business world, right, it opens up a lot of doors and, and opportunities for innovation and uh, reinvestment. So I think right. there is maybe that aspect as well, why it, it can seem attractive to people that maybe you wouldn't think it would be. Um, right, I, yes, I definitely agree. So, um, so how would a carbon tax uh, uh, impact low income communities? And, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear if you've um, kind of heard anything from environmental justice organizations or, or communities on kind of how they're reacting to the conversation around um, carbon taxes or, or uh, some sort of um, carbon pricing system. Right. Um, I think that's that's one of the most important conversations to have about um, carbon pricing mechanisms because it will increase the cost of everyday goods. Uh, some sort of carbon pricing mechanism will increase cost of every everyday goods. Um, um, and that price in some way, probably not the entire price of, of, of a tax or what have you on carbon will be levied on customers, but some of it will. Um, and for carbon or for, for market-based mechanisms uh, or, mar or market-based policies, they, they've definitely been proposed in the past as ways to help low income and marginalized communities. And then in the past, they have also been used to, to make it worse off for these communities. Um, you know, it, they've been promised to, to, to better their, their lives and what have you, and then it doesn't, and then it may even make it worse off. Um, so there is a lot of distrust of, of market-based solutions in sort of low income and marginalized communities, which th that, that cannot be ignored, you know? Um, and I, I don't, I guess I don't wanna make a, a generalization of what sort of environmental justice organizations uh, feel about carbon pricing. Uh, because again, like, <laughs> I just don't wanna make a generalization, but I guess it kind of, because there are different people within organizations, different organizations that believe uh, different um, different things about about carbon pricing and how it will affect their communities. Um, uh, but I I remember hearing from um, Tina Johnson, who is the National Black Environmental Justice Network director. Um, and I'm going to try to paraphrase something that she said uh, actually on the Citizens Climate Lobby call a few months ago, um, where she talked about having, you, you can't come into a community and say, oh, this policy will help you and expect them to be like, okay, thanks. Um, you have to have these communities involved in or leaders in these communities and in, in environmental justice organizations involved in the policy writing. And the policies have to be created uh, using sort of a lens of environmental justice. It can't be a reaction, you can't create a policy and then be like, hey, can you look at this? Can you read this? Do you think this is okay for your community? because they won't come back and say, oh yes, of course this is great. You know, it's, it, it's not that easy. And um, the, the, policy has, the policies have to be created around having this in mind rather than as a reaction to, to responses from these communities. Um, 
yeah i if that makes sense <laughs> yeah, i i apologize for paraphrasing it um because i don't want to i don't want to take her words incorrectly but i would if i had the link to that off the top of my head i would send it but i do not right now <laughs> yeah certainly it's it's much easier to have uh, a lot of community engagement when you're doing things on a state level um national obviously is national politics just a nightmare flat out um i applaud all of those who are involved in national politics uh so i tend to hang my hat on the state and local level um but but um you know that was one of the big issues around the transportation transportation and climate initiative which was modeled after the regional greenhouse gas initiative um but towards transportation right it was essentially kind of like a cap and trade system on uh, transportation emissions and uh it 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 seemed like it was going pretty smoothly and then i i think what and what happened was you didn't have that kind of consultation with environmental justice communities and and low income uh represented organizations. And it, it ended up getting a huge pushback from those individuals when they kind of got a hold of the policy and said, but wait a minute, right? Um, how is this going to affect our communities? And how is it going to benefit our communities? And so certainly, you know, we want to not keep repeating these same you know, mistakes over and over again. And so hopefully, you know, when it comes down to brass tax on, on a carbon tax, whether it end up being regional or national, um, hopefully we'll we'll get it right. Um, and I uh, appreciate all the people that are doing work to try and keep moving us forward in the right direction. So um, I think we kind of covered a little bit on cap and trade. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, direct carbon taxes. Um, and so I just kind of want to get your opinion on what do you think would be more feasible in the US, what maybe more or more palatable um, which way do you kind of see this going? I mean, certainly in, in regional contexts, or if you're California in California context, right, we have a lot of examples of cap and trade. Um, I think that we can go off of at this point. And I know there's cap and trade programs in a lot of different countries around various things um, to help control various things. Um, but we also have great examples of carbon taxes working in other countries. So what in the in the American mindset, right, what do you think uh, is more likely to happen first in the US? Um, well, first, I'd like to say that I feel like uh, car carbon taxes and cap and trade, I feel like it's kind of like fashion where one comes in, the other one goes out back and forth. Cause I remember um, even when I, when I started college, and maybe like end of high school cap and trade was really big and I was like wow this is great this is the best thing ever and then I learned about um carbon fees and I was like oh I like this one this one sounds cool too and I feel like it's kind of come come in and out of which uh, uh people prefer um but sort of something that I've learned along the way are some like key components that climate solutions should have to be good climate solutions. Uh, the first being it has to be effective. Um, you know, it has to do what we want it to do and it has to do it soon. At this point um, for us right now with kind of the range of time we have to, to close in on having some effective climate solutions, it has to happen soon and it has to do what we, we're, we want it to do. Um, another another sort of aspect of it is that there has to be some sort of, of choice component in it because <laughs> as we've seen over the past almost year is that Americans don't really like to be told what to do. Um, and so there has to be some sort of choice. Um, you know, we, we can't exactly just take away um, all these carbon options for people who are saying that this is what they want. Um, it also has to have some sort of broad political support. So it has to, um, people have to like it. People, people have to be interested in it. Again, you know how, how cap and trade was really what people were interested in before and now people are kind of more interested in carbon fee. It has to have that sort of momentum behind it. Um, 
so that it can, first of all, pass uh, a very divided um, legislation, and then it can stay. Um, it doesn't get pulled, you know, when a new administration comes in. Um, and then it has to be, you know, good for the economy, good for the people, good for our health, good for the planet, you know, it kind of follows along with the, the, the effective part of it. We want it to, to benefit us and our planet. And then it also has to be fair in that those who are going to be negatively impacted by the, the legislation have to be accounted for. And so that, so that sort of ties into what we were talking about earlier about um, low-income communities you know, how will this, how will this negatively impact these communities and how can we mitigate that or make sure that these people are still made whole um, as a result of this policy? Um, and so that does make me lean towards more of a carbon fee and dividend where it's, it's revenue neutral and the money goes back to either you know all Americans or low income communities um, to make sure that it does so to make sure that it doesn't um, disadvantage these communities more than they are disadvantaged. Um, again, I think that carbon fees are kind of more in right now. So that may give it some more uh, broad political support. Um, I, I do feel with a steadily growing fee that it can be effective. I, there's been several studies shown that, that some sort of carbon pricing mechanism is effective and can be implemented quickly so that we can start reducing carbon now. Um, and it does, it does leave room for choice because companies and consumers can still choose to consume carbon heavy products. It will just be disincentivized. Um, because the price is increasing, but they still have the choice to do so. Um, and so I, I am definitely leaning towards um, carbon fees and dividends that where the dividend goes back to, to citizens and um, individuals. Yeah, certainly there's been um, also a conversation on, on who gets the money, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's been proposals where everybody gets the money, right? Regardless of income, but then there's also been kind of targeted um, individuals uh, to get the get the check. Um, I've seen proposals uh, from and suggestions from groups like Union Concerned Scientists and others that um, kind of deal with one, you know, what what's that starting point, right? Union Concerned Scientists are like, we need to be way up here, you know, in the hundred plus dollar. Um, and then a lot of the proposals start out kind of like $25, $40 and then kind of eke their way up um, where Union Concerned Scientists are like, nope, right out the gate, hundred some bucks, and then it goes up, right? Um, but then also on, on where the money goes, I know we've talked about whether we reinvestment, which um, somebody asked, uh, um, you know, cap and trade, if people would get that money back, whereas the Tax and Dividend Act, right, it does go back. Um, cap and trade, what we have right now, does tend to go more towards investing in technologies and and offering programs um, like Reggie and the Green Energy Fund generally um, helps fund programs for low-income communities with weatherization, energy efficiency, all of that kind of stuff. Um, whereas, yeah, a, a tax and dividend, right, would just be you get a check in, a check in the mail or it's tacked on your taxes or what have you. Um, but certainly, you know, a lot of the equity issues that I saw was you have, you know, wealthier people to a point do spend more dollars, not proportional to income, but more dollars playing out on energy and, and, and carbon intensive things like uh, bigger vehicles and more of them. Um, Larger houses. Exactly. The portion of, you know, the in proportional terms though, it's not as proportionally higher a percentage of their income, which is what you see in low income communities. You have, yes, older cars that tend to be a little bit dirtier, um, you have less energy efficient housing. And so they spend more proportional amount of their income. And so they would need obviously more uh, help and would be possibly injured more from uh, you know, a carbon tax given that uh, proportionality aspect. So 
it's interesting. And, and that's kind of one of my hangups, right? Is who gets the money? If we're not reinvesting mm -hmm. in technology, that's just going to kind of, kind of work broad and broader strokes. Um, how do we make sure we're targeting people that are most harmed, right? And to help right. them out. And of course, that's also the conversation with renewable energy and, and things like that, where we have equity concerns. You know, how do we make sure that we have equity and access to cheap solar energy? And if we're doing like expensive, you know, big energy projects like offshore wind, you know, how do we make sure that it's not hurting low income communities? And and so that's always a big concern and probably one of the biggest discussions, right, is, is how do we make sure we're not unduly harming people how we're trying to make the world a better place right it's always the hard right. part um so beth actually asks uh there's something like 11 carbon pricing bills introduced in the last congress do you think any of them will go through the legislative process as is or will do you think some of kind of hybrid bill will emerge that's a good question um Um, I guess I'm expecting some sort of, I think a, a lot of, a lot of people are probably expecting some sort of um, climate bill to be coming from the Biden administration or uh, yes, yeah, some sort of climate pack package coming from the Biden administration. Um, and uh, the, a lot of, a lot of his advisors are actually, um, or some of his advisor, advisors have talked about um, interest and support in, in carbon pricing. So including uh, Janet Yellen, uh, Pete Buttigieg, um, John Kerry, they've all, they've all made statements in support of, of carbon pricing. So that's also a, a question that I kind of have. I, I am, hoping and expecting some sort of package to come out uh, that has carbon pricing in it, especially with these advisors, these prominent advisors who, who've spoken out in support of some sort of pr carbon pricing mechanism, um, especially since no one legislation and no one type of carbon pricing is going to be the silver bullet or to, to fix all of our, our climate change issues um and so I, i'm hopeful of some sort of of package coming out um, um however um being someone involved with citizens climate lobby i am hopeful um that if that is not the case that the energy innovation and carbon dividend act uh gets gets um the ball rolling um since it is a a carbon fee and dividend um, legislation that has some bipartisan support or had some bi bipartisan support in the House um, the last session. Um, and it sort of followed what, it, what we were talking about earlier in that it it gives money back to, to individuals. So it does align with, with um, what I, I am most interested in for carbon pricing. But again, there's a little bit of bias in that. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's okay. You can be you can be a little biased. It's all right. Um, we understand. Um, so uh, Becky over on Facebook uh, just commented, maybe dividends to our underfunded public school system, especially in lower income, uh, both urban and rural, might be a way of getting more buy-in. So it is, um, you know, there's always an interesting conversation of how do we target the funding to where it's needed the most, right? And and I right. know. Um, you know, like with Reggie, right, we target specifically uh, those funds to help um, weatherization programs and other low income energy audits and, and things like that to, to, yeah, to get the money where it's most needed, I, I guess to say. So um, if you have, uh, just as a kind of fair warning, if you have any other questions, we are kind of coming around to the end here now. So uh, just make sure you drop those in the comments or in the chat and we'll make sure we get to them here. Um, so just in your personal opinion here, Olivia, if people wanted to, to do something, I always like to end with an action. I feel like we get people all riled up sometimes and tell them good or bad news. And then we're just like, oh, bye. Um, <laughs> so I always like to end with an action. So um, if, if somebody wanted to do something, uh, what would be your recommendation to help move forward um, some kind of carbon pricing mechanism? 
Sure. So um, I know I feel like everyone's probably heard this before, but write to your representatives. Um, <laughs> um, definitely, I would say writing to both state uh, representatives if you're interested in implementing carbon pricing on a state level, um, and then also writing to your senators and your house reps um, saying that you want some sort of carbon pricing mechanism and in even including some of these um, things that we've talked about today about how you would like that revenue to be used. Um, I think that is an important factor to, to write to your representative about um, to ensure that 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 um, that that part of your your opinion on it is also included in what you're saying. Um, something that I write about often when I'm writing or calling my representatives is asking that they they try to be bipartisan um, in their climate solutions um, um, because of how sort of down the line our national representation is. Um, I think encouraging representatives to do that may make it easier for us to pass something, some sort of climate climate legislation um, um, if we get folks across um, both sides of the aisle to to engage in climate legislation. Um, and then I also saw something pop up from Charlie um, to writing to to the editor. I love that idea of writing to, to the editor saying that you know you're interested in carbon pricing, talking about carbon pricing. Um, I think there's still a large amount of people who have some misconceptions about carbon pricing or don't understand it or don't know about it. Um, so really getting the awareness about carbon pricing out there is is a great step as well. Um, so thanks for, for throwing that in there. I'm glad I saw that pop up. <laughs> yeah, and Charlie, you're like a you're like a, a psychic or something. Um, so we are uh, we have our digital action team. Um, it's a, a new team at, at Sierra Club at the Delaware chapter. Um, and we meet every month to try and come up with actions we can do, right, as, as environmental advocates to help in, in the environmental advocacy world. Um, particularly right now, of course, it's the digital action team, primarily because we're stuck inside on the digital world. Um, so they're all actions that you can do from home uh, in the comfort of your, of your house, on your computer, generally speaking. Um, and so, but this month coming up in March, uh, it's on March uh, 10th. Um, we're actually going to do a letter to the editor training. And so if you're interested in learning how to write an effective letter to the editor uh, and find out what different, uh, you know, uh, publications in Delaware take those um, and get some tips and all that, um, join us on the 10th. I'll put in the, I'll put in the link here. Um, you can RSVP to join us. Uh, Heather Connell is the chair of the, of the digital action team. And we're going to co-lead that training that was actually uh, built by um, Delaware United, one of our friends in the advocacy world uh, a number of years ago, but it's still tons of good information. So we're going to go through that as a group and even write a letter to the editor uh, with each other uh, on the Zoom there. It's generally you know, 100, 150 words, pretty short. Um, and we're going to, to work one out together on whatever you want. If you want to write one on carbon tax or community solar or renewable energy or climate change, what have you, all are welcome. So uh, come and join us there on the 10th. Uh, and of course, uh, since you didn't mention it, uh, maybe because you're, you're interested, you don't want to be too biased. Um, join CCL, join Citizen Climate Lobby. Um, we have chapters in the North and the South here in Delaware. Um, so, you know, so they're one of the main leads here on, on carbon taxing and they have two chapters in Delaware. So um, get on it, join them. And if, you, if this is where your passion is, I spoke to a student group. Uh, yeah, thank you, Beth, citizenclimatelobby.org. Um, I spoke to a student group last night. And of course, one of the questions that it comes up every time, but every time like a deer in the headlights, right? I, I never know how to react um, is what, what do you say to somebody who's just getting involved <laughs> and how to get started? And I like the, the old switchboard analogy, right? Um, for those that are, you know, not there like all Gen Z's and younger, so they didn't know what I was talking about. But I was like, you know, when you got like a phone, it's got like a bunch of lights on it, right? Um, it's kind of like that. 
I said, you know, you get into advocacy world and you got all these lights blinking at you, right? And you're coming into it with all the lights already blinking. You don't know which one was first. You don't really know which one is the most important, right? All it, it's just a bunch of blinking lights that are all want your attention at the same time. And I got news for you. It doesn't actually matter which one you pick first. It, it really doesn't. So just pick one and just go down the rabbit hole uh, and, and you'll be all right. And if you don't like that one, hang up the phone, pick up the next blinking light, right? So it, there's no right or wrong place to start. Just click a, pick a blinking light and dive head in. Um, so if this is your thing you want to dive head in on, get on board with CCL, citizenclimatelobby.org, and uh, they'll set you in, on the right path on how you can help. So Olivia, I really appreciate you uh, joining us today. And I appreciate all of our uh, attendees here on Zoom and on Facebook. We've had a pretty steady stream over there on Facebook. Yes, Becky on Facebook. Um, help elect candidates that you know are on board already. <laughs> beats, ba beats banging your head against the wall trying to convince legislators who never will be. Yeah, sure. I mean, get out there and volunteer, right? 2022 is a huge election. And speaking of which, I, I can tell you're from Maryland because you said reps with a plural. <laughs> Delaware only has, we only get one. Um, you know, she's a great one though. She's a good one. So um, she's on board, I'm sure. But call her up anyway. Tell her you're supportive. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks so much. Um, and we'll see you, I believe, uh, next week. We have uh, D Durham on the 5th, I think. Is that next week or maybe the week after? March 5th, uh, we're meeting with uh, Representative D Durham or Councilwoman D Durham, sorry. Uh, to talk about zero waste policies. And of course, for those, those who don't know, the Youth Environmental Summit is taking place next week. Um, so if you haven't got your tickets yet, uh, you can, I'm sure, Google Youth Environmental Summit. It's also on our Facebook page. Um, those kids have done a, a fantastic job of doing a virtual event this year. So um, looking forward to participating in that. So thank you all very much. You guys have a great weekend and uh, stay safe out in this snowy weather. Thank you.